wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks, this is Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming here with a great podcast. We certainly, certainly appreciate you guys being on the show. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, remember, be sure to put your arm around your friend, neighbor, relative, and say to them, look in their eyes deeply and say with as much warmness, affection, and empathy as you possibly can. Yeah, people can tell I've set something up here. Huh? Tell them that, hey, have you heard about our, our wonderful family that we have? The Chris Voss Show podcast family, the family that loves you but doesn't judge you. Grab your phone and subscribe to the show. Tell them to subscribe to iTunes. And if that doesn't work, say or else. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Please don't do that. I don't want you to end up like Mike Tyson on a plane today. If you're watching this 10 years from now, you can Google what that means. Anyway, guys, go to <laughs> goodreads.com where it says Chris Voss. Hit the bell notification button on youtube.com for it says Chris Voss. And also see our big group on LinkedIn, the 122,000 group on LinkedIn. And uh, also our LinkedIn newsletter. That thing is killing it over there. That LinkedIn is swat right now. Yeah, that's my best Zoolander. Sorry. So we're excited to announce my new book is coming out. It's called Beacons of Leadership, Inspiring Lessons of Success in Business and Innovation. It's going to be coming out on October 5th, 2021. And I'm really excited for you to get a chance to read this book. It's filled with a multitude of my insightful stories, lessons, my life, and experiences in leadership and character. I give you some of the secrets from my CEO Entrepreneur Toolbox that I use to scale my business success innovate and build a multitude of companies I've been a CEO for uh, what is it like uh, 33 35 years now we talk about leadership the importance of leadership how to become a great leader and how anyone can become a great leader as well or order the book wherever fine books are sold anyway guys uh, we have another amazing author on the show today we have with us Leah Le Leela Ibrahim Lila, Lila. Did I get that right? Ly Ly Lila. Lila. Just ignore the A. Ignore e the A. Ibrahim. Did I get that all right? <laughs> Lila Ibrahim. Lila but I've heard it all. Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Uh, she and I had that written out, too. That's really funny that I still did not get that right phonetically. She is on the show with us today. She's a multi-book author, and she is the author of Scarlet Carnation, a novel that just came out April 1st, 2022. I doubt it's an April Fool's joke. It really did come out. She has uh, her book out. She's going to be talking to us about some of her stuff that she's done and how she's done it. She is the best-selling author of Golden Poppies, Paper Wife, Mustard Seed, and Yellow Crocus. She spent much of her career as a preschool teach director, a birth doula. I'm not sure I got that pronounced right. You did uh, pronounce that right. Did I? But you're going to have you to tell it. us what that is when I get done here. And a religious educator. That work, coupled with her education, developmental psychology, and attachment theory, provided ample fodder for her novels. She's a devout Unitarian Universalist determined to do her part to add a little bit more love and justice to our beautiful heartbreaking world she lives with a wonderful wife rinda and two other families in a small co-housing community in berkeley california her young adult children are her pride and joy well i hope so it'd be funny if, if you had that in the bio like i was I'm embarrassed not, by them i'm embarrassed by them i think my mom would have that in her bio she is busted <laughs> working full-time as a novelist. When she isn't writing, she likes to take walks with friends, do jigsaw puzzles, oh, those are fun, play games, work in the garden, travel, cook, and eat all kinds of delicious food. Welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you. I'm humbled by your, well, yeah, your tagline, all your stuff. I'm like, wow, I'm that smart. I'm going to blow people's brains away. <laughs> well, yeah. So you've got quite your the, you've got wow, quite the ramp that you uh, we've put uh, on you for pressure. Yeah. I'm just the idiot who shows up and hosts the show, but we have all the smart people on the show to come uh, tell us all the good stuff. So well, what's, uh, give us your .com so that people can find you on the interwebs and uh, oh, to know you better. Yeah. LilaIbrahim.com. So that's pretty easy. And on Facebook and just if you Google Lila Ibrahim, you'll find me. I pop up. 
I'm one of the first Lila Ibrahims there. There's also a doctor, Lila Ibrahim, who does lots of interesting things. You know what you <laughs> do when doctor. people when people share your Google name? You uh, hire Hitman. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that, folks. Lawyer said I can't say that anymore after the judge says I can't do that anymore. Anyway, guys, uh, so what motivated you want to write this book? This is your, how many in, an, in a series? This is my sixth novel, and it's my fourth in the Yellow Crocus series, or I call them companion novels. So... Yeah, Yellow Crocus is what called me to be a writer. Like that story just like poof came into me and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And when I was 40, I decided I would start, I sort of thought of it when I was 33 and I started writing it when I was 40 and I didn't know how to write. And then it, I ended up self-publishing it and it got uh, picked up by a large publisher. They wanted to know what else I had and they didn't want my second novel, but they said, you know, are you interested in doing anything else? And I said, well, I'd do a sequel to Yellow Crocus. And they said, okay. So I did that sequel. And then when I was done writing that sequel, I had written a couple other books that were not in the series. And I thought, I, I kind of, you know, I think it was probably around 2016, 2017, 2018, and the Black Lives Matter movement was very large. And it's something, you know, racial, race in America has always fascinated me. And the racial, the caste system baked into the United States was always fascinating to me. And like how the very small mechanisms of that and how they impact people in a very uh, specific way. And so I just thought, wow, it would be really interesting to take these characters and the descendants of these characters and just revisit these same questions every 20 years or so to see how we got to here. And my children went to this elementary school called Malcolm X in Berkeley, is a, a, one of those most exceptionally class and race diverse communities probably that could exist. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about, like, I learned so much from those children. I learned so much from those families about both sides, right? There's owning class, there's undocumented immigrants, like all in a classroom together. And it's like, how do we get here in this moment, like in this classroom, in this neighborhood? So, so I just, I think it, I just, it struck me. Like, I think I'm going to revisit all these characters about every 20 years and see how the, the, the the their lives have evolved in mm -hmm. this culture it definitely has been an interesting 450 years in this bloody country so i don't use a london england thing maybe it's because we left there i think that's where that joke came from i don't know what that means so real quickly though what is a uh birth doula i'm probably i need to know what that is now i can't yeah you said it exactly right it's a birth doula and it's a woman who provides or it could be a man but it's mostly women who provide physical emotional and informational support to women and their partners oh. before during and after birth so it's oh. not the medical side so mm. like a midwife or a doctor does the medical side but during actual delivery like the moment a baby's being born they have to ignore the birthing mother practically, right? Really? Because they're suddenly taking care of this baby, oh, right? Like they're... what's important is what's going on between this woman's legs, not what's mm -hmm. going on between, you know, not that they, it's just, there's a lot going on in the room. And so I'm the companion that can be there in their house with them, help them transfer oh. to the hospital, be at the hospital the whole time. In today's society, like you don't have your mom or your cousin or your aunt mm -hmm. as your companion during labor so birth doulas are your companion during labor yeah i, I tried being a birth doula her. once but i kept going ah. when they were giving birth and the legs were in the stirrups and it was coming out i kept yelling hike 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 and what? they fired me within a week uh, yeah didn't work out for me but didn't work uh, out for you. It's an interesting business, but evidently I was doing it wrong. Uh, I'm surprised you were hired, but you know. That's, I was surprised I was fun. there too. Well, they were, I think somebody, I don't know. I don't have a joke for that. But so I just pictured it in my mind. So tell us about, tease out to us. Like you, of course, can't tell us the, you know, all the details of this uh, because the, this is different than a non, our nonfiction authors because, you know, the nonfiction authors can tell us what happens. Yeah. Tease us out some of the different points or different aspects of the story that you think are fun. Yeah. So what I like to do is start with my main characters and I kind of know who my main characters are. And then I like to research history. So my two main characters in this one are May, who's a white woman, who's the grand granddaughter of the woman in Yellow Crocus, who was the daughter of the slave owners. Mm -hmm. And then Naomi is the granddaughter of Maddie, who was the enslaved woman who was brought into the house to take care of Lisbeth. So these are two families that have been entwined since Virginia, and they're now in 
Oakland, California. It's uh, 1915. Uh, and and so they, they're, they're connected to each other, but they're like second cousins. Like they're kind of close, but really it's their grandmothers who are very close and their mothers are sort of close and they kind of know each other. May thinks she's uh, a modern, liberated woman who has, she's enamored with the birth control movement and with Margaret Sanger and women's liberation and making a great life for herself. And Naomi is wanting her children to have as much freedom as they possibly can as she's seeing kind of the she's one of the people that's involved in the NAACP in Northern California and wanting to ensure that the the rights that her children have will be maintained in particular around housing and housing segregation is one of the main focuses of the book and then there's the war you know oh. so that starts and World War One is coming into it. The eugenics movement is an important part of the novel. My young, older daughter has mild cerebral palsy, and she's someone who, had she been born before the ADA, would have probably had a very different life than the life she has now. Mm. And so this was a time period when they started institutionalizing um, people who were born physically different and physically disabled. So, and the, like the bedfellows of the eugenics movement, the birth control movement, and the public health movement mm -hmm. were all kind of compelling to me. Yeah. During this time period. There you go. There you go. What are, what are your favorite characters in the book or the favorite character you maybe have? Interesting that you say that. I think, you know, I'm still so fond of Lizbeth. So I think Lizbeth is still a very, you know, and she's now like this grandmother and she's very maternal, very, very wise and very calm and very like, you know, listen to your own heart, listen to your still small voice, as we say in my religious tradition, like go inside and listen for what it is that you really need to do. And don't listen to all the noise of the society around you or the people around you to know what's the right thing for you to do. That's um, true. If you, if you trust society, especially on, if you go on Twitter, you might have a hard time figuring out what the right thing is to do. Sorry, that's my Twitter joke. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't, you don't want to follow society. So that makes sense. I mean, you don't don't. Have you been on Twitter lately? It's it's you don't want to use that for any sort of society. No, you do not. Yeah. And you know, but thankfully really they is, didn't have that back the, then, so that's probably good. Well, yeah, they did and they didn't, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I'm sure they had some bad society stuff going on. That always. Right? I mean, that's one always. of my main themes. Like, it's just always going on, right? You think, oh, like that it will be over this. We'll like we'll cross this hurdle, and then we don't have to deal with this stuff. And it's like, no. We always have to deal with this stuff. It's always going to come up. The one thing man can learn from his history is man never learns from his history. It's really annoying. We should get over it. You know, it's it's interesting to me. You mentioned, uh, the, you know, Malcolm X and a few things earlier. You know, James Baldwin, you can literally take everything James Baldwin said in, in the 50s and 60s and, like, just reprint it now. And it's, like, all, like... Like nothing's changed. And of course, he didn't think things were going to change either. He hoped things were going to change, but it's kind of interesting. So do you, do you, do you, is there a reason you picked uh, her as your favorite character? Is there something that reminds you of yourself in the character or, or other people? What, what kind of made you uh, mix that one your favorite? Yeah. You know, I think that it used to be Maddie was my favorite character because I wanted to be like her. And now I think, okay, now Elizabeth is that character because that's who I want to be when I grow up. I think there is a sense of which I want to be able to have faith in the face of hard things mm -hmm. and have enough context to realize like you can just do what you can do. doesn't mean you give up, right? Yeah. The fact that you can't fix it all, it doesn't mean you get to give up. So it's that right balance, right? It's that right sense of what's yours to do and what's not yours to do. So yeah, I think both so those much, characters have figured it out. Yeah. There's only so much you can do, but I mean, that's probably why a lot of people find in lessons like novels and stories is hope and, and, you know, being able to learn stuff from stories and everything else. What are some what are some things that you, you you find with your readers that they really love about your books? What are some of the feedback they give you that they really find make your books appeal to them and bind to them, if you will? Yeah, I think so. All my books have birth scenes, like pretty intense hmm. birth scenes. And most is there a guy there that are... says hike, hike, hike all the time? 
I'm sorry. We kicked him out. We kicked him out of the room. Yeah, Definitely. Him, yeah. 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 You're out of the room. Yeah. That's yeah. a joke. I think people really appreciate that. And it's one of those things that's like not in novels a lot for scenes, which seems a little crazy to really? me, but it's not. It seems Before like a normal thing because it's, I'm I sorry, aren't you? And all, before I wrote Yellow Crocus, I had read one birth scene in the novel in my entire life. And I was like, I'm going to have a birth scene in there. That was the best scene ever. It's like a battle. It's like a little battle thing. And, you know, how many battles have I read about with broadswords and bows and stuff? So there's always that. And then there's a lot of, of faith, but it's a very personal faith. It's about someone's kind of like turning inward and like the prayer or the thinking inward of what what it is that I want or what will give me strength or what will give me hope in the face of hard times. So people talk about that a lot. Complicated mother-child relationships, we, people talk about that. And then the history. Like I, I do find these horrible nuggets of history where you think, really, that can't be true. But it is. And it's like, it's like just the mechanisms of systemic oppression and how they're codified in a city, in a state, in a neighborhood. That's what I look for. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting how all that's built into our society. I mean, yeah. race, systematic racism is so huge. It's, it's mm -hmm. funny, but no, it's birth is a battle. I mean, I was 10.9 pounds. So when <laughs> I came out of birth, so it was, there was a battle that ensued evidently. And my father's hated me ever since, but there's but your that. Mother came around eventually. <laughs> Well, I mean, she really didn't have a choice, I guess, when it came down to it. You know, there's a certain point where it's like, get this thing the hell out of me. And, uh, but no, that's interesting. I didn't know most books that, you know, people don't write about are birthings. I mean, why is that? That seems kind of, I mean, it's a human experience of normalcy. I mean, I don't know. What I think is, and, and you know, so what I think is interesting about the time we're living in now is like, even when I wrote Yellow Crocus, so that was in the early 2000s there were these gatekeepers in the publishing industry who literally said to me like nobody wants to read this story <laughs> and i'm like are you kidding me yellow crocus has sold a million copies hmm. and like but i had dozens of people say to me nobody wants to read this story wow. and i think they believed it or that it's been written and I, i'm like hmm. how fantasy books have been written how many war espionage books have been written what do you mean this book's been written and i would ask them and they couldn't really name that book mm -hmm. and so i think they're like the gatekeepers to the publishing industry were you know older men for huh. decades and mm -hmm. they're like who wants to read a birth scene like why would anybody want to read a birth scene i would and, think it would be really appealing to women to women yes yeah. but they they weren't you know it seems like normal to me. Publishing has like pulp, you know, blend blown open, and what's out there has been blown open. Now that those gatekeepers, straight white men, aren't the only ones deciding who what we get to read. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, to me, it seems literally normal. Like it's like eh, people. I mean, they do every they write about everything else that happens with normal people in a book. I mean, yeah. And, yeah. you know, you know, my mom went through an adventure having birth. I saw her with her fourth birth just before, I think a month before giving birth, she had like, uh, she passed the kidney stone and that was, that was hell in high water on top of, you know, being nine months pregnant. And of course there were complications after the birth. I mean, it's a whole, it's part of life experience. What are some other teasers from your book that we can tease out to readers that to maybe any, any cliffhangers or any suspense things that maybe they find interest with? Well, one thing that was really interesting to me as I was researching the book is in the, so I was researching it in the fall of 2019 mm -hmm. and I saw images from Market Street in San Francisco of people celebrating the end of World War I. And guess what they were wearing? Hmm. Face masks. Oh, I had yeah, never right. seen an image of people wearing face masks <laughs> celebrating the end of World War I. I was like, how did I not put that together? Yeah. And part of how I didn't put it together is that in New York and in Chicago, which is where I'd seen all the images from, they weren't having a big flu bout in that moment. It didn't yeah. happen everywhere at the same time, right? It was a much more whack-a-mole thing because there wasn't flight, yeah. uh, air travel, right? So the flu, the 1918 flu is not a huge part of my novel, but it's definitely in there at the end. And it mm. was certainly very interesting, both researching it, researching the same arguments around whether you should mask or not mask up, 
whether or not vaccines should be required, whether or not a vaccine would even work, like all that was in the newspapers. So that was super interesting. And I knew after I researched the novel and I saw that scene, I was like, oh, I think that's going to be one of the, my closing scenes of this book. There is, you go. Um, is, you know, mass revelers in, yeah. So, so that was a very fun thing to research. The, I mean, it's interesting how you just reminded me of that whole flu uh, pandemic. I mean, hopefully we don't have, hopefully it's another hundred years before we have another one. Let's put it that way. Cause I'm pretty sure I won't be around, but I really, really wouldn't want to wish that on the future. So uh, there's that too as well. So this sounds like a really fun book. Readers can uh, of course experience in a lot of different formats. Anything more you want to tease on the book before we go? Let's see. What else would I like to hold up about the book? You know, one thing I think that's that I really do like to hold up is the fact that it's just individual people making individual choices mm -hmm. that allow us to move towards greater freedoms for all people, what I call mutual human liberation. Mm -hmm. Dr. King called the beloved community. It's just humans making those choices and that we can make those choices in our small ways, in our small communities, or in larger ways for someone who's a larger influencer but everybody can do something so that's what that's part of what i just try to hold up in all of my novels is like here's the ways people are making choices that expand liberation for the most people and that's the beautiful part giving hope and getting people to understand that so that so they're inspired to do the same thing and learn yeah. from history technically yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well it's been wonderful to have you on the show thank you so much for coming on we really appreciate You're very it welcome Thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me on the show, and you're just delightful. Well, I try to be. I mean, the jokes are awful, but yeah, you try. It's cool. you're trying hard. <laughs> we try hard to entertain you. So, give us your dot com so people can find you on the interwebs too, please. LilaIbrahim.com. You can find me there or on Facebook. Same thing. Facebook.com forward slash Lila Ibrahim. There you go. Guys, check out her book and uh, her newest book and all the books in her series uh, and uh, all the ones she's written. Uh, Scarlet Carnation, a novel, just came out April 1st, 2022. Get her wherever fine books are sold. Remember, don't go into those alleyways. Yeah, you might need a tetanus shot if you do that, if you go in those alleyway bookstores. Could just go into the fine bookstores. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. Go to youtube.com, Fortress Chris Voss. So go to goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Voss. And all our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram as well. Thanks you for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time.